Hello folks, this is Steve A. Before you. As many of you know, I spent four years in Israel. And by the way, nothing in this episode is a promotion nor is it a recommendation. I spent four years in Israel, including one war, the 1973 Yom Kippur War. So I checked back with Israeli online sites. I'm mainly interested in the what I call the security situation. I mean, I've, I've had terrorists try to kill me and my friends several times in Israel. Actually, nothing has changed. That was 50 years ago. Nothing really has changed. They're still trying to do it. So this is the time of Times of Israel. And earlier I was looking at this to see what the articles were and as I'm scrolling down, see this particular article. <clears throat> now, I've told you that a few years back, I met a young Israeli here, working here, who um, grew up quite close to where I was during the war in 1973 in Western Galilee. And uh, he was in the intelligence service of the Israel army. He was from a mixed village. There are a lot of Arab villages in Western Galilee. And his is a mixture of North African Jewish immigrants and Bedouin Arabs. No, the Bedouins live in places other than the desert. So, um, one of his prized skills was his, and he knew, he said he knew a little bit of Arabic. His parents came from North Africa, so they spoke Arabic. His neighbors spoke Arabic. And I once asked him, do they ever have you listen? And he said, what do you mean by listen? <clears throat> I said, well, we really fought hard to regain the top of the Hermon is a listening post into Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, West Bank, cell phone and radio intercept. Oh, he says, oh, yeah, yeah. Especially during, they do, they have me listen, especially during arrest operations. That's what he said, arrest operations. That's what this is about. Palestinian killed during clashes with Israel Defense Force near Jericho. A Palestinian man was reportedly killed early Wednesday during clashes between gunmen in Israeli forces near the West Bank city of Jericho. You've heard of Jericho. Smash the pots and reveal the lights and the walls of Jericho fell down when they all shouted together. Who led that military operation? Can you remember? How long ago was that? That was Jericho. So anyway, the Israel Defense Forces later said troops opened fire after Palestinians hurled ill explosive devices at them while they were carrying out an arrest raid in that particular place, which was one of several across the West Bank overnight. See, I'm connecting something that somebody told me a few years ago with a current event, an arrest operation. <clears throat> it doesn't do any good to serve an arrest warrant. You have to go in and get them. So they go on and on and on. Uh, 
After the operation in that particular place, the IDF said troops operated in Hebron and numerous other Palestinian towns, arresting 12 suspects and seizing numerous weapons and ammunition. According to the military, soldiers were also met with violence during a raid on Katana, where they used riot dispersal means that's tear gas, stun grenades, and fired into the air in response to Palestinians hurling bricks from roofs. There was a raid a few months ago where an Israeli soldier died when somebody dropped a rock off of a roof onto his head. And shooting fireworks at them, no troops were wounded there either. Now hang on. <clears throat> The military said that as troops entered the refugee camp to arrest a number of wanted Palestinians, armed clashes broke out. So I've set the scene for what happened yesterday, last yesterday night. Now we get to the important part that I wanted to show you that was new to me, but I can think of it in a way we have a local person that for three years, see, they built the bypass, US 64 bypass around Asheville, and a local person who's a friend who has several drones with movie cameras, you know, video cameras, posted almost daily videos of various aspects of the construction project. I learned how to build a road watching it for three years, over 300 videos. Pay attention. The IDF said it used a Raphael Spike Firefly loitering, ammuni loitering munition. Let me say that again. Raphael is the name of a company. They used a Raphael Spike Firefly loitering munition. I never heard that phrase before. I never heard that term before. Also known as a suicide drone against a number of armed Palestinians who endangered the forces. What do you see happening here? Now that might be the drone or it might be the other side setting off roadside bombs. This is in Janine. So I put in Raphael's Spike Firefly Loitering Munition. And there are three videos here on a YouTube channel by Raphael Advanced Defense Systems Limited. I'm going to show you some screenshots. But I also, Raphael Dynamic Defense Company, Raphael.co.il, Spike Firefly Trademark Miniature Tactical Loitering Weapon. Here's their document. Spike Firefly Trademark Miniature Tactical Loitering Weapon. Well, we can see how it can loiter. And what do we see on the bottom? It looks like a drone camera. What do we see on the top? We see the engine. And there may be another engine, but what's that thing in the middle? 
behind cover precision attack capabilities for the dismounted soldier. Never heard phrasing like that. Now, dismounted means he's gotten out of the Army personnel carrier and he's maybe under fire and he's over behind a rock. Dismounted soldier. Behind cover, precision attack capabilities for the dismounted soldier. Sounds like a field tactical weapon. This is the first time today that I've ever seen one of these. Behind cover tactical precision firefly tactical weapon system is a revolutionary innovative miniature electro optical tactical loitering munition designed for light maneuvering ground forces such as infantry, marines, or special forces. Now think of all those movies from the 90s and the 2000s where they ah uh, where they the, they drop a sniper crew by helicopter up on a hill and they're watching the cartel gang getting together and and those guys are going to guide a missile that's coming fired from someplace to blow them up. But that's a big missile. But you have to have somebody down there, or, or like happened especially in Afghanistan, a 10 Warthog, right? You know about these guys. You see this thing here in the snout? So our guys in Afghanistan are pinned down by snipers or something. And they get on the radio and they say, is there an A-10 loitering in the vicinity? We need help. Yeah, we got one we can send over. And so when he comes over, the guys anticipating that these kind of things can happen have a laser pistol and they pistol laser at where they can see the guy shooting at them. And the laser beam is encoded and when the A-10 comes down, he's got special goggles, electronics equipment, telescope that can see the reflection of the laser. And he goes, Burr! and he fires 4,000 rounds in 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And anybody who was where that laser is pointed is gone. But an A-10 is a big airplane. Oh, by the way, why do they have two engines in case one of them gets hit? Why are they at the back? When you're coming in and people are shooting at you, it's protected by the body. There's two guys sitting in here. They're in a titanium bathtub. Why? because the A-10 is meant to come in at a couple hundred feet. Put it in and people are shooting at it. Doesn't do any good. The guys are sitting in a titanium bathtub. They can fire rockets and they've got that big 30 caliber Gatling gun in the nose that literally can fire three to 4,000 rounds in a half a minute. It doesn't have to be terribly accurate. Now, why am I going over this? Because I want to contrast it to what the Israelis are doing. I spoke about a situation where go, you can see the videos. You can read the news articles. They testified between before Congress when Congress was the Air Force wanted to get rid of the A-10 and all these guys who had been ground troops said, are you kidding? Don't you know what the A-10 does? I'm alive because of one. 
they were dismounted in hiding under attack. The A-10 was called up and they had a system for the A-10 to save them, extricate them, obliterate the enemy. Let's go back to the Israeli thing. So here's another document. It looks different. It says miniature loitering munition. Here it is next to a soldier. It's about the size of the drone my friend was flying. Oh, look at this. He's got a tablet. And look at this. Like my friend, he would take his cell phone, put it on the radio control thing. The drone takes off. The camera is working. He can see what the camera is seeing while it's recording because it's transmitting a video signal back. Besides that, it's got GPS. It's got a map. It, sometimes it got, a couple times it got lost. It sent a signal to the, 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 to the company and you're able, he was able to download the last location and go and find it and retrieve it. So it looks like it's really something like that, except this is not meant to be used the way my friend was using them. Technical specifications. Weight, 3 kilograms. Engagement range, 500 meters, densely urban. Or, 1,500 meters, open space. So, it is intended to be in a place like Jericho, Janine. Velocity, while it's maneuvering 60 kilometers per hour, about 45 miles an hour. A dive, then it says dive attack speed. Huh? Attack? Lethality. Blast, fragmentation, Warhead. It's a grenade. I remember a guy, well, I can remember, remember they said he was in the 1948 war in Israel. He said the Iraqis had joined the war and they were on the hill facing where the kibbutz was, where we were. <clears throat> and he was telling us what kind of weapons they had. And he mentioned that they had homemade hand grenades made of cement with gunpowder in them. And the Hebrew word is, he said for them, was shifshufim. Now, you would translate it as match-lit hand grenade made of cement. Leishaf shaf is the Hebrew verb to strike a match. So they called these things shifshufim, they're grenades, because you had to light a match and light the fuse and throw it. That was 1948-49. Let's see what they're doing now. See, they made the grenades themselves. That's a home industry, home armaments industry. So let's look at three pictures from the video. It looks like another different model but they keep calling it Spike Firefly. We can see the camera down below. You see it down here? This is so it can come down on a tripod like that. And here's the motor for flying it. I don't think this one is necessarily... The battery must be in here. Let's look at another part of that. Oh, see, the guy's got the tablet with an antenna on it. He's getting an aerial view from the camera. Maybe there's also a GPS map. But here's the important one. You see, if you were watching this, you would see it fly in the window of the building where the guy is that's shooting at you. Chief Shufin.
So I learned something new. I just, I followed the security situation in Israel. I was reading the Times of Israel. Just thought I would share it with you. Steve A.B. Foyal, just letting his mind wander. Reminiscing a little bit. Learning something new by brainstorming it. Saying, see you in 73.